Just imagine that we were back in a period in history before the automobile was created and you had come up with the idea and after much persuasion you'd managed to convince the authorities that it was not such a bad thing to have people travelling around in individually controlled metal boxes. And then the authorities said to you, well, OK, but how are you going to keep them apart? And you said, well, we'll paint white lines on the road and we'll put up little coloured lights which will let them stop and start. Really, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? And therefore, it's not surprising that we need some protection in an area that looks very much like a battle zone. Ah! safety characteristics but a bit of a problem it's very expensive and it's not exactly really good on line handling I reckon that on Australian roads, that's about the only thing in which I would feel entirely safe. But of course, it's completely unrealistic and therefore, we have to make do with what we've got, both mechanically and personally. Tonight, I'd like to take a look at how you and I can avoid being involved in a motor vehicle collision. And what we need, just in case we are involved in some sort of collision. And then next week, we're going to look at the things that you don't need in case of collisions. And as a result of those two programs, hopefully, we will all be able to avoid running into one another. My first point is that there is really no such thing as a motor vehicle accident collision, incident, whatever, but not an accident. When two cars come together, there are almost always one or two people responsible. And the so-called accident could have been avoided and therefore was not an accident. And secondly, I'd like to explain why it is that we've chosen the Mazda 626 for both of these programs. It is a classic representation of the car of the 80s. It's the right size, it's compact, carries four passengers in comfort, has a two litre engine, a five speed manual gearbox, good brakes, good handling, and good primary and secondary safety. Okay, so four things you need on your side when you go driving. Primary safety, secondary safety, maintenance, and technique. The first two, you buy. The second two, you provide. I've said it before, but it's worth repeating. Primary safety is the ability of the car to do the things that you expect it to do. That is to provide good road holding, to provide good accurate steering and good handling. And don't be too concerned about a little bit of body roll. It might be to a degree uncomfortable, but body roll helps to dissipate cornering forces and the car therefore is less likely to slide. And lastly, to be able to stop quickly in an emergency without lockup and in a straight line. Now, if your car was built, let's say, before the middle 70s, it probably has those qualities in less degree than the more recent cars, where those features have become more important to manufacturers, but principally because the consumer is now demanding them. 
what is important is that you know and understand the various characteristics of performance of your car and particularly with reference to braking and cornering. Secondary safety is the capacity of the vehicle to protect you in case you do happen to have a collision, which is still not unusual. And we've made some giant strides in the past 10 years in these areas with compulsory things such as crash padding and seat belts and even deformable panels. You get an idea of what I'm talking about right here. Enormous impact, but it stops about there, meaning that this passenger cell is still reasonably complete. Still things to do though, the passengers and the driver in this vehicle would have been thrown around a lot and as such very likely hit their heads along this sill here and maybe even on the B pillar. Those are sort of areas which still do terrific damage to people's skulls. So we haven't finished with secondary safety by a long shot. The indications are that you need to consider it when you're buying your car and go for as much secondary safety protection as you possibly can. Take a look around, bear in mind the reputation of the vehicle and spend the money if you have to because it will help you. It's round right about now that we've got all of that organised that uh, things usually start to fall apart at the seams. There isn't really much point in all of the manufacturers going to the trouble of giving you the right equipment, the right performance, unless you're prepared to care for it very carefully. We talked about tyres not so very long ago. Just take a look at this. Keeping the tyre pressures high and perhaps even higher slightly than the manufacturers recommend enhances and complements the natural handling characteristics of the car. So if it's a good handler, like the 626 for example, it will be even better. You don't need to feed in so much steering input. You get more response and greater accuracy simply because the tyre is more stable on the rim. Now that's not necessarily uh, an indicator that you need to go and exploit those characteristics of handling, but they are there in case you need them for an emergency swerve and recover or in case you've arrived at a corner going faster than you would like to. Now I'm going to let the tyre pressures down to something approximating where they might be if you'd ignored them for a month or two, as people tend to do, and then we'll see what happens. As soon as the tyre pressures go down, a number of things happen. Firstly, the steering is heavier, noticeably heavier. And secondly, you have to start feeding in more steering to get the same reaction for the corner. That is, you've got to turn harder to get the same degree of turn. And there is less response. That is, the tyre reacts slower to the change of direction. All of which are really only disadvantageous when, again, you're in an emergency situation, but the point is you only notice it happening very, very slowly and very steadily. You may not be aware of it until it's too late because it's, uh, it just creeps up on you. It takes a couple of months for those tyre pressures to go down to that extent. Now, I already don't like them down, so I'm going to take off and pump them up again, and while we're pumping them up, we'll talk about some other things you need to think about as well. One of the things that's wrong with service stations these days is that you really don't get very much service anymore. 
and that comes about very largely because of the need that everybody expressed to get in and out of service stations very quickly, that is to get your petrol and get out. Such, as a result, we've got self-serve service stations. Look after yourself when you come in and that gets you out faster, supposedly. It also means, however, that you don't have done for you the things that once upon a time we used to take traditionally for granted. The responsibility for looking after your car in those areas has always rested with you, not the service station proprietor. It is your car, you're the one who needs to look after it. And from this point onwards, you will be responsible even more for looking after your car than you have done in the past. All of this area is an area that you should know and reasonably well. And although sometimes you can get in and out fast just for petrol, occasionally you should plan to take the time when you arrive at the service station to check certain things, certain obvious things in some cases like oil, water, battery water, but less obvious things like windscreen washer bottles, which occasionally run out when you least want them to. And incidentally, while you're on that, don't forget to give the windscreen wiper blades a wipe because you will almost always get dirt from them. And that dirt smears the windscreen and makes it more difficult for you to see. Make sure that there is brake and clutch fluid in the reservoir. And in more technical areas, make sure that somebody is looking after your brakes particularly for you, because if you don't, this sort of thing can happen. Of course, check the lights, all of them, and make sure that they're clean. And don't forget that to check the brake lights, you'll need somebody with you, because somebody's gonna have to push the brake lights so you make sure they're working and they are pretty important lights. I guess the object lesson of all this is that you really should have your car checked, serviced thoroughly and regularly. And for preference by somebody who really knows what they're doing. That's not normally you. There are a lot of things that you just simply cannot even check at home, let alone repair. That means your local service station operator or perhaps the people who sold you the car in the first place. And it's not a bad idea to stick to the service booklet. The manufacturer does know what sort of things should be serviced and when. And that brings us to an interesting point about the second car you probably have at home that you spent very little money on, on for somebody else in the family to drive. It probably was a bit of a bomb when you got it. It probably gets less attention than it deserves. And in fact, because of that alone, it needs more careful service more regularly than the main car, which is much newer. Okay, once you know, not think, but know that your car is in as good condition as it could possibly be expected to be, then you've got to go out there and do business with those people and try and stay alive. The idiots, the drunks, the crawlers, the daydreamers, the clowns, us, all of us, alike. How do you do that? For me, it's the driving that really counts. And certainly it's the part that I enjoy most. I try to find a way to make it, for me, always enjoyable. And it continually surprises me to find people who think of driving as nothing more than a chore, just a method of getting from point A to point B. That in itself is the sort of attitude that's likely to cause problems, dramas, even potential crashes. I really believe if we could get everybody enthusiastic about driving, 
if we could get them to be as conscientious about driving as they are about their weekend game of golf or tennis, then there would not be anything like the same number of problems on our roads. It's not difficult to do if you consider driving as being the challenge that it really is. Don't simply take the motor car for granted. Find a way to enjoy what you do with it. Simply be as smooth and as accurate and as committed to driving as you feel that you really should. In any traffic situation, even in peak hours, it is possible to make something of what you're, what you're doing. If you have passengers, keep your passengers absolutely at ease. Make every gear shift as smooth as possible. Make every application of brake as smooth as possible. Try to read the traffic flow so that you are, in fact, one up on everybody else around you without necessarily hassling or harassing them. You're one up on them simply on the basis of your real talent. It is a challenge. It can be, as a result of that, very enjoyable. And it tends to become, as it uh, develops as an enjoyable pastime, something to which you commit a great deal more concentration and time. And then, if everybody could do that, we're a nation of good drivers instead of a nation of bad drivers. Let's reduce that talent I'm talking about into some specific areas. Firstly, cornering. There's a natural inclination for most people to turn into corners too early, to hug the inner line. This has three disadvantages. One, you can't see the shape of the corner or what's coming. Two, you'll find yourself having to pull harder on the wheel to stay on line. And three, you'll end up too far wide at the completion of the corner. Now, watch the Mazda. It starts nearer the centre line, turns much later, and exits much tighter. Have a look at the difference with them both together. and have a look inside. First the Falcon, and look how busy the driver is. And now the Mazda. One long, smooth turn. Once you understand the function of line, that is the importance of having the car accurately placed on the road, then you'll need to concern yourself with the method by which you can most effectively keep it on your chosen line. And then you'll be involved with the very high degree of importance that we place upon the use of throttle, gears and brakes. And if you're good, you'll learn very quickly that a great deal of subtlety of operation is required. Nothing violent, no violent usage of the steering wheel, no violent braking, no violent acceleration. And then even in the most difficult conditions, it's possible for you to remain accurate, well positioned and under control. The point is that any violent movement, any violent reaction with steering or with brakes or with throttle causes the car to become unbalanced. Let's face it, the motor vehicle is already an unstable platform as it is sitting on four springs. Anything you do to increase the instability of the car will cause it to be unbalanced to the extent that you'll have difficulty in controlling it, let alone maintaining a reasonable line. Now, in an earlier program, we talked about how important it was to learn how to match your engine revs when you're shifting down. You'll use that technique quite effectively under these sort of circumstances. And I guess here is the best place to show you what I'm talking about. This is a skid pan, tight, wet, oiled, and very slippery. And yet for as long as I drive very steadily, the slipperiness won't bother me in the slightest. But if I start doing anything violent at all, I will be in trouble by braking suddenly. The car will suddenly come unstuck because there's nothing to maintain adhesion between the tyres and the road, other than your smoothness of control. Let's look at it again with a braking exercise in a corner and see what happens. It just slides off the road. It's difficult to maintain straight line. In fact, you can brake hard and 
turn and the car doesn't turn. It just goes on sliding straight ahead for as long as the wheels are locked. So you can see the important single ingredient to build into your driving as far as you are concerned, that is the driver, is smoothness. The next thing you have to concern yourself with is where to drive. That is, where to position a car on the road to give you the most even flow in the traffic system. Normally, you are confronted with either a three-lane road or a two-lane road. Let's deal with the three-lane road first. I would suggest, generally speaking, that you're better off in the centre of the three lanes. Although sometimes that lane seems to move slightly more slowly, Overall, it generally appears to get people where they're going just a little earlier than people who keep changing lanes. This particularly matters on a road where there are a lot of red lights and where invariably you find yourself confronted with the very annoying situation of people making a right-hand turn and not signalling until the last few seconds. You're jammed up in the right-hand lane and you can't move until that car's made its turn. While we're on the subject of positioning yourself on the road, you must also consider your relative position to other traffic and most importantly, to the car in front of you. Don't get too close. The business of tailgating has no future. If the car in front stops suddenly, you're almost certainly going to wear him. But apart from that, it gives you no capacity to evaluate and to appreciate the traffic flow. So give yourself that cushion of space between you and the vehicle in front of you. You can see better, you can read the traffic flow better, and you can always stop in time. On two-lane roads, it's even more important to stay well back from the car in front because you will certainly need to do some lane changing from time to time. In general, you'll have to drive in the lane closest to the centre of the road, but be prepared to change. Give yourself the flexibility of movement to move around vehicles doing things that might otherwise cause you obstructions. And don't change lanes rapidly and indiscriminately. If necessary, stop and wait. Better to do that than it is to do a sudden change of lanes and find yourself pushing somebody into the curb, or worse still, into the opposite lane of traffic. One of the really great challenges of driving is to be able to see understand and react to everything that's happening around you and it really is a challenge one of the ways in which you can make sure that you have the capacity to do that is to talk yourself into it and i mean that quite literally as you drive along describe to yourself what it is that you're seeing from every area of your vision and then respond accordingly let's just try it and i'll, I'll see if i can't show you what i mean OK, there's a traffic light ahead and we obviously must stop for it. There's pedestrians on that particular crossing and there's a lot of traffic coming out of that intersection. OK, just stop here and wait momentarily. You need to know where you're going. And it's a nice idea to plan ahead so that you're not confused about direction and those sort of things. OK, away we go again. Traffic moving away fairly smoothly. A lot of cars parked to the left. A fellow getting out of a car. He's not walking across the road. That's OK. Car backing into a driveway on the left there. No other dramas at the moment. Set of lights ahead, they are green at the moment, but there's a chance they'll probably change by the time we get there. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, the traffic in the intersection cannot move for that reason. Now, there's no reason for me to be in any other lane than I'm in, and I'm a reasonable distance behind the car in front of me, and there is a car behind me. The car in front's slowing down for the vehicle which is turning right. The car behind me is a Volvo, and it's too close. That's his problem, not mine, but I don't like cars that close to me. OK, now we're moving up towards the section of road which becomes the expressway. And I need to know where my turn-off is because I don't want to get on the expressway. OK, I turn right to go in the direction in which I want to travel. The lights there are red. You see what I mean? You can keep that up indefinitely. And, of course, if you're travelling with a passenger, you're going to sound a bit strange. So do it when you're on your own. But what it does is to increase your powers of observation to the point where nothing escapes you. 
where you see and identify all of the things that are taking place around right throughout the whole periphery of your vision. When you can do that, then you are truly observant. And what's more, better than being observant, you are concentrating on your driving. And your concentration is terribly important. If you think all that talking to yourself is a bit fanciful, remember that pilots do it almost all the time, and particularly with pre-flight checks. It's a great pity that we motorists don't do something very similar. We might last a little longer on the roads. And that applies not just to that sort of thing. Bear in mind all of what we've been talking about, and there's a fair chance that you can avoid all of the collision situations that crop up on an almost day-to-day -day basis. It's worthwhile. It'll help you to stay alive a little longer. And right now, I'm going where there's very little traffic at all. Thanks to Angry on India X Rail for us now moving uh, for the previously uh, notified taxi. India X Rail. Next week in the final edition of Talk, Peter Werrett will be looking at the effects of drugs, tiredness, irritation and alcohol on drivers. And he'll also examine the Renault 18 GTS and the Mazda 626. Stay on ABC Now for Spring and Fall and a magnificent performance from Michelle Forden in the powerful drama The Silent Cry.